Luke chapter 16 will be the text that we will look at this afternoon, uh, continuing our look at uh, the, some of these parables that we see in the Gospels. Uh, we are looking this afternoon at the parable of the unjust steward, starting in verse 1 of chapter 16. He also, he also said to his disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward, And an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I am ashamed to beg. I have resolved what to do. That when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? So he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. So the master commended the unjust steward. Because he had dealt shrewdly, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches... And if you have, been, have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So if we, as we look at this parable, first of all, let's look at some of the facts of the parable. First, we look at the steward. A steward was a manager of the household. He managed the property, he managed the businesses, and he managed the household of an owner. We see in verses 1 and 2 that he was dismissed because he was wasting or he was squandering his master's goods. Verse 3, we see the perplexity of the steward. You know, seeing the end of his position, the question came, what shall I do when I'm discharged? He knew he wasn't strong enough to be able to do hard work, and he was too proud to beg. So the steward then has steward has a little bit of wisdom, verses 4 through 7. He won a home with his tenants by reducing their bill. And he possibly could maybe become a steward to one of them, but he reduced their bill and gave them a way out. And the steward then in verse 8 is commended for this. He's commended not for his misuse or dishonesty, but for his wisdom in preparing for his future. He knew that the wealth which he had entrusted to him and that was in his possession was about to be taken away. He used that which was entrusted to him to make a future for himself. Later, when he was without food or shelter, Those that he had befriended would then take him into their homes. You know, we can admire that part, the looking at the the wisdom that he had there. You know, we admire the wisdom of Rahab the harlot because of her faith and works. Not because she was a harlot or because she lied to the people about the spies, but, you know, we disagree with, with that motive, but we... Uh, can look at her and admire her wisdom because she knew that she needed to follow God and she had faith that they were going to take care of her. You know, we may disagree on the doctrines of others, but, you know, a lot of times we see something that we can commend. You know, uh, just for an example, what about the Jehovah's Witnesses? I mean, their doctrine is very far off, but what about their zeal for evangelism? I mean, Couldn't we look at the way they evangelize and learn something from that? (laughs) For sure. You know, we we can look at that and we can take application from it. So let's look at the application of this parable. You know, a contrast between the sons of the world and the sons of light. And we see that in verse 8. 
where he says, So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. You know, the sons of the world use more wisdom and diligence in gaining their objective than Christians sometimes do. You know, people (coughs) in the world sometimes act with more forethought and diligence and are more prompt and alert in their pursuits than Christians are. We see that, right? You know, for example, you've got an avid golfer, got an avid fisherman, an avid seamstress. You know, the more that they pursue these things, the better they are at them. You know, likewise, we have got to be the same and have that same commitment to our pursuit of serving God. We need to be experts or pros at living the Christian life. You know, we can look at uh, some people in this world and we can look at the way they act and the things that they do and the way that they do them and we can learn a lot of lessons that if we took some of those same you know, some of those same characteristics and put them to use in our Christian life, how much further would we be? You know, again, if we look to the Jehovah's Witnesses and we look at the way they evangelize, the way they go door to door and the way they evangelize and hand out flyers and things like that, we can learn a lot. And we would greatly expand the borders of the kingdom. But then he gives an admonition in verse 9. I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon that when you fail they may receive you into an everlasting home. Mammon here, this is the Greek form of an Aramaic word that's used for money, riches, and property. Money, riches, and property. Um, You know, it's called unrighteous, not that the material that it's made of is corrupt or you know, not that in and of itself is, is corrupt, but that it is often obtained and used for unrighteous purposes. How do we handle the things we have been blessed with? You know, give to saints in need when their friendship, those who, you know, how, how do we handle that? Do we, you know, do we help people out? That's, that's a lot of the reason we do, Right. You know, it, it's another way of saying that if we use our money in the right way, it's good for us. Jesus' words are keeping in the words of the parable. You know, we need to, um, we can use those things, win those friendships, and we're going to have a home in heaven someday. You know, our use of our money determines where we're going to spend eternity. We should use what we have in this life in the service of God to help and to ensure or assure an eternal reward. Now, there are eternal reward. I can't even talk. Must have had too much chili. Yeah, there's only four possible uses that we can make of our money, that we can make of the stuff we have. We can use it. You know, we understand a certain portion of it's got to be used to sustain life, but we can use it. We can waste it, we can hoard it, or we can give it, right? I mean, those are the four options. I I can use it, I can waste it, I can hoard it, I can give it. You know, there was an epitaph once carved on a tombstone. What I spent, I used. What I saved, I lost. What I gave, I have. Interesting thought, right? What I spent, I used. What I saved, I lost. What I gave, I have. What do we do with the things that we're blessed with? You know, what are some ways we can use our money rightly? You know, we can do good to all, especially Christians. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. That tells us when we have opportunity to, to do good to all, especially those in the household of faith. You know, we can give to those who have need. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28. We need to, we can visit widows and orphans. James 1 verse 27. Uh, you know, the visit here, the, the meaning of that word visit means to go and see with the view of aiding. It's not a go and 
talk for an hour. It is go and see, is there anything I can do for you? That is the way that word is written. Visit widows and orphans. We need to be compassionate toward a brother in need. 1 John chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. We need to have compassion on those that are in need. Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 37. And then we need to give liberally to the Lord's work. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. These are the ways that we can effectively use our money, and that's part of what he is talking about in this parable. Well, what are some ways that we can abuse that money? Well, one way is that we forget that we are merely stewards of it. We are stewards of the money. The the money that, that we have, the things that we have, belongs to God, and we are entrusted with care of it. You know, we abuse it when we love money and desire to be rich. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. We abuse money when we are covetous. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. We abuse money when we are greedy and selfish. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, which tells us, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition. We abuse our money when we hoard what we have. Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21. We abuse our money when we fail to give to those that are in need. Luke uh, Luke 16, verses 19 through 25. So he talks here in this section, an application toward how do we use the things that we have been given. But then he also... In verses 10 through 12, he talks about fidelity and service. Fidelity and service. And, you know, faithful in least, faithful in much. Unfaithful in least, unfaithful in much. Unfaithful in mammon, unfaithful in true riches. You know, if we are unfaithful with the things that we have here on this earth, how can we handle the true riches that are coming? Unfaithful with someone else's things. Why? Who would give you your own if you can't handle theirs? Why would an employer give you a paycheck if you are stealing and mishandling the things for your employer? You know, you're not going to have a job and you're not going to receive that paycheck. You know, what you obtain for your very own depends on how much or how well you use the things of someone else god requires that christians be faithful in small things as well as large things have you ever heard people justify taking pens or paper clips or things like that from the office i have it's just a pen it's just a box of pens They're not faithful with the things there that they have been given. They're they're not faithful with those small things. Well, Matthew 5, verse 19, Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men, so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Well, wait a second. The small stuff matters? (laughs) Yeah, the small stuff matters. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2, Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. You know, Christians who are appointed small tasks are, you know, if they do them well, then we are proven dependable and we can be entrusted with greater things. You know, one family one time was frustrated because... They wanted to do some type of work that the congregation was doing. They wanted to be involved in that work and be able to lead that work. And another family was chosen. When they went and talked to the eldership about it and asked, why were we not chosen? The elder looked at them and said, when was the last time you were on time? Seems like a small thing, but... If you're never on time for worship, 
why would we entrust you to be in charge of whatever this task was? You know, it's something small. You've got to do the small things to be given the big things. You know, there was a situation where a congregation was trying to encourage an older brother to do better in his faithfulness and attendance. And they thought that if they gave him greater responsibility, he would do better. So they made him treasurer of the congregation. Well, the older man became the kind of treasurer that he was in his attendance. He didn't pay, his, pay the bills on time. <laughs> You know, again, why we don't give people things to do if they haven't shown their faithfulness. Uh, unfortunately, congregations tend to do that. But you need to be doing well with the small things you have been given. You know, Jesus then says, no servant can serve two masters. You know, we can't serve God and we can't serve the things of this world. You know, faithfulness to one we have to be faithful to one or the other. We can't do a part-time on both. Uh, God says it is more blessed to give than to receive. So our mammon is, is measured by our possessions and our things and, and how we spend our money. Again, what's more important? You know, we've got to make the decision which things are more important. And sometimes that's difficult. Sometimes that's, that's very difficult to decide. You know, sometimes jobs uh, can become an obstacle, right? We, we understand that. Jobs can become an obstacle sometimes to doing the work of God. Again, what's more important and who do we serve? Um, you know, 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 11 says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. You know, there is coming a great and final audit, and each will be called into the master, and the master will say, give an account of your stewardship. And at that time, we will give an account of how we had handled our stewardship in all matters. You know, how, what's more important to us? What's the most important thing? What are the things that we value? And that's going to be called, and we are going to have to give an account. Luke chapter 16, verses 14 and 15 says, Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. You know, what do we learn from the parable of the unjust steward? How are we using the things that we have? And where is our heart? What does our heart seek? What is the most important thing in our lives? How are we doing things? What are our actions? How are we giving? Because that shows where our heart is. You know, we as Christians need to make sure our heart is in the right place. And if there's anything we can help you with, please come as we stand and sing.